Um, but I do appreciate you being here uh, and attending this session here. Uh, this paper was first presented at the Midwest Evangelical Theological Society last year, um, which was hosted here in Grand Rapids, just down the road at uh, GRTS. Um, and so my focus, my scholarly research has been on uh, the history of biblical interpretation, particularly in the Reformation era, um, and then demonstrating that, especially by looking at uh, this guy, Johannes Echolampadius. And uh, if I gave a, a handout there with some brief background on him. I'm not going to say much about his life and history, um, but just kind of bring in some of the key factors uh, as we look at this topic of the doctrine of adoption. Um, so as you may be aware, in the Reformation, in the time of the Reformation, 16th century, there were a lot of changes that took place in the church. And one of the big changes was uh, what, what some scholars refer to as even an explosion of biblical commentaries, of writing commentaries on different books of the Bible. Most people, Protestant writers, uh, first wrote on the book of Romans, um, primarily because that's where a lot of the key themes from uh, the Reformation, justification by faith alone through grace alone, are found most clearly in the book of Romans. Um, and so these are central gospel uh, books. Uh, yet justification was not the only doctrine that was drawn from the book of Romans that also was what I call reformed, in kind of the little r sense, reformed during the time of the Reformation. Another doctrine which has frequently uh, been overlooked in both historical and theological studies that was reinterpreted during the time of the Reformation is the doctrine of adoption. Um, a few scholars have actually observed and documented the noticeable absence of the doctrine of adoption in creeds, in summaries of uh, theology, in systematic theology, in summaries of faith, and even in uh, biblical commentaries. One dissertation even goes so far as to assert, quote, so substantive has the church's oversight of adoption been that it is far easier to document those who have focused on adoption than those who have not. It's so little. It's so uh, little explored, little done. Um, and actually, when I presented this, I found out after my presentation that the author of that dissertation was sitting there uh, in the audience with me. So we had a great conversation afterwards. Um, his, his dissertation is in a historical study of the doctrine of adoption in the Calvinistic tradition. Um, and so it, it, it fit well. Um, and he's actually working on revising some of the work he's done. Now, so with the Reformation, the attention escalated toward the legal aspect of justification uh, with it, in, so, in soteriology and salvation, um, but also there were these changes with adoption. Even though it remained in the background, uh, it was also a, a change that took place during the Reformation. And this has started to gain some interest more recently. Um, there's been increased interest in the doctrine of adoption. Um, some of you may have seen Russell Moore's book, Adopted for Life. Um, C.J. Mahaney has been doing work on adoption. Uh, both in popular and historical works, it's been typically identified that this doctrine is, quote, mainly but ex not exclusively a reformed distinctive, which can be traced back to John Calvin himself. Scholars indeed have demonstrated that although Calvin doesn't treat adoption as a singular specific topic in his Institutes of the Christian Religion, uh, it is nonetheless a central component of his soteriology, of his theology of salvation. Brian Garrish even asserts that Calvin describes the gospel itself as, quote, quite simply, the good news of adoption. Um, as these scholars note, the significance of the doctrine of adoption for Calvin can really only be gleaned from a study of his exegetical works, his biblical commentaries, because he doesn't develop it that thoroughly in his systematic works. Um, and this especially includes his comments on Romans chapter 8, which is the focus for what, uh, what we are going to be doing. And so here's uh, images of the cover pages for Acolampadius' commentary on Romans and uh, John Calvin's commentary on Romans. And I've put up there the English translation, uh, if you can't read the Latin there as it's broken down. Uh, <laughs> annotations on the, on the epistle of the blessed Paul the Apostle to the Romans, taught by Johannes Acolampadius of Basel and the commentary on the Epistle of Paul to the Romans by John Calvin. And so this is going to be uh, our focus uh, for this paper. Um, the reformation of the doctrine, though, can only really be seen in comparison to what previous people had said about it. Um, so David Steinmetz and other scholars have rightly complained that traditional scholarship with regard to Calvin has pretty much treated him as kind of an isolated figure 
that is not in conversation with anyone in, in, his, in his era, in his time. Um, that they've kind of reconstructed his theology without reference to his contemporaries. Um, more has shifted toward things like what I'm doing where let's hear from other people besides Calvin and what we see is that Calvin is drawing from a lot of those uh, other people at his time. And so one conclusion from this previous approach has been to state that Calvin's emphasis on adoption was unique and unparalleled among his contemporaries. What I've done here is show it's not unique and unparalleled. There's other people, namely Acolampadius, who have uh, addressed this as well. So the intent of this paper is to broaden that lens on Calvin, focus on Romans 8, 14 to 30, and include this frequently overlooked reformer, Johannes Acolampadius, on how he explained in comparison to what Calvin explained uh, from his Romans commentary uh, to see what the, the, the noteworthy uh, similarities and differences are. Um, part of the reason I like studying Acolampadius is because nobody else is doing it. Uh, in the, in the, the critical edition of Calvin's Romans commentaries, uh, which is called the Calvini Opera Exegetica on Romans, they, he, there's several others, uh, other interpreters who are the THL Parker had compared to. Acolampadius is not there. Um, in fact, I, don't, I didn't find that he's anywhere in any kind of comparative work on uh, Romans with Calvin other than one, uh, one article by Akira de Mura from about 20 years ago. Um, so if you're wondering more about Acolampadius, that's why I gave you this uh, brief biographical sketch, the handout there that gives you some of his dates and some of his key accomplishments. And on the back side is all of the biblical commentaries that he published, um, which is pretty incredible, pretty astounding. Um, and it's actually somewhat surprising that more research has not been done on him uh, over the years given the, the influence that he had and the publications that he uh, created. So here's Calvin's picture, a drawing of Acolampadius up there. Um, let me give you some background on their two Romans commentaries. All right, so Calvin was in fact one of the reformers whose first biblical commentary was the Book of Romans. Uh, his first edition was published in 1540 with subsequent revisions and republications in 1551 and 1556 and it was translated into French in 1550. That's all evidence that this was a very popular book um, and that people really wanted to purchase and use Calvin's uh, Romans commentary. And there's uh, certainly a lot of coherence between the Romans commentary and his Institutes of the Christian Religion. In fact, both the introduction of the Institutes and Romans commentary refer to one another as if you want to see more on the Bible, go to my commentaries. If you want to see more on theology, go to the Institutes. Um, so Calvin's preface and dedicatory letter in his commentary on Romans provides good insight into Calvin's own thinking about his development of theology in these theological topics. For our purposes here, it's worth noting that the dedication of the commentary written in the fall of 1539 was to Simon Grenaeus of Basel. You don't know who Simon Grenaeus is. Let me tell you who Simon Grenaeus is. He was the successor of the ch of, uh, to the chair of theology at the University of Basel, previously held by Johannes Acolampadius. So Grenaeus is the guy who follows Acolampadius as the chair of theology. A few years prior to the publication of Calvin's Romans commentary, he actually lived in Basel in 1535. While he was in Basel, in, in refuge, uh, he wrote the first edition of the Institutes. So in 1536, Calvin has published the first edition of the Institutes in Basel. July of that year, Calvin left Basel for Geneva where he began lecturing on Romans. T.H.L. Parker surmises that Calvin was already planning and may have even begun writing his commentary on Romans while still in Basel but that the first edition of the commentary came primarily from the lectures, what he taught uh, fall of 1536 to spring of 1538. For those of you who can do math, you see that's more than just one semester. That's like a little over two years. Um, and that Calvin worked his way through Romans. So Calvin's connection to Basel, which is where Acolampadius was the main uh, person, the head of the superintendent of the clergy there, uh, one of the main theologians there, uh, that, that can't be overlooked. Um, his time of refuge was only a few years after Acolampadius died. So you see on the handout there that Acolampadius died somewhat young uh, in 1531. 
but his legacy and influence was still strong in Basel actually for decades. They're using his catechism, they're using his commentaries, uh, the way the church is structured is all uh, has this influence from Ocalampadius. And so it's likely that Calvin encountered the teaching of Ocalampadius, although little can be said whether or not he actually had access to Ocalampadius' Romans commentary in, in writing. It seems pretty likely that he did, but there's no evidence that we can securely point to and say, you know, here's, here's where he uh, uses Ocalampadius' Romans commentary. But more than a decade before Calvin began teaching on Romans, Ocalampadius began his series of biblical lectures on Romans at the University of Basel. Um, his was not the first commentary or the first uh, lectures. He actually began on the book of Isaiah um, and taught for quite a while on uh, Isaiah. And then at the end of June, 1524, so if you're familiar with the dates in the Reformation, 1517 is kind of the year that we identify as the start of the Reformation. Luther nails the 95 Theses to the Wittenberg door, uh, that, that this is only seven years later um, that Ocalampadius is lecturing on Romans and teaching Protestant truths. Um, so two letters from Ocalampadius to Guillaume Farrell show that he began these lectures on August 3rd, 1524. Uh, he taught through this book until late October of the same year. So he only spent a few months on it, whereas Calvin spent uh, many months on it. Um, about a year after he began the lectures, in August 1525, is when the, the Romans commentary was actually published. Um, and a letter from Hedio shows that many were eagerly anticipating the publication. Uh, while there's little concrete evidence in the sources that show how it was received, a second edition was published in January 1526. So at least enough people were interested in buying it right away that they justified uh, creating a second edition that same year in Nuremberg in a different location. Um, in one of the few comparative studies, the one I mentioned uh, about by Akira Demira, uh, he compares their exegetical comments, Aquilampadius and Calvin, on topics related to justification, sanctification, the sacraments, and asserts that, quote, without a doubt, Calvin had Aquilampadius' exegetical works beside him and consulted them with reasonable frequency. And in 1540, the very year that Calvin published his Romans commentary, Calvin specifically appreciated, expressed his appreciation for Aquilampadius' Isaiah commentary. So if you're familiar with the way Calvin says things, uh, he often gives less favorable opinions of people who disagree with him. Uh, he, he, he gave his opinion about Capito, Zwingli, and Luther on their works of Isaiah, but then he states this, therefore no one so far has engaged more diligently in this work than Aquilampadius though he too doesn't always hit the mark. Uh, very, very Calvin. Uh, he never agreed with anyone completely. Uh, but this is one indication, though, that Calvin was positively disposed toward Ocalampadius' works. And even if Calvin didn't have Ocalampadius' Romans commentary right there, he was no doubt influenced by Ocalampadius' teaching, his connections to Grineus, but also Heinrich Bollinger, who Ocalampadius, or Calvin does identify in his preface that he has used Bollinger's work on Romans, as well as uh, Melanchthon and Martin Bootser, who also have connections to Ocalampadius. Um, so even if it can't be substantiated that Calvin has that Romans commentary with him, certainly the influence uh, from Ocalampadius has come through these other people. Now, before we look at Calvin and Ocalampadius, I want to say just a little bit about the prior medieval exegetical tradition um, in order to get to see that this, there's this uh, shift, this change, this reformation that takes place. Um, so what I looked at was several resources, but primarily focusing on the Glossa Ordinaria, uh, Nicholas of Lyra and Denise the Carthusian, who are um, summarizing and pulling together uh, the teachings in the medieval period. And so this is a, an image of what the Glossa Ordinaria looks like. Um, so this is the biblical text here, and then all these other words are comments from other people, and the glosses are these um, kind of like study Bible notes from a whole bunch of people throughout the ages. So they'd revert, refer to Augustine or to Anselm, um, and Nicholas of Lyra in some editions also gets included with that. Um, so it's a great resource to look at what's the prevailing theology of this biblical text at the time. Uh, and so I, I can't give you everything that it says about all of these verses uh, in Romans 8, but what I want to highlight are the certain emphasis. Um, what may be 
uh, unsurprising is that there's a strong ecclesiastical and meritorious reading of adoption. So, for example, the Glossa Ordinaria states that being ruled by the Spirit or being led by the Spirit is to act rightly, to do what's right. Uh, the Spirit of adoption is the giver of good works that are from His mercy. One becomes a sharer in Christ, or the word that we translate now an heir, uh, through the merit that comes from one's own suffering, and then the Spirit aids that. So the phrase is, the Spirit does what our merits cannot do. So we work enough as sons, as adopted sons, and then the Spirit adds to that wherever we're lacking. Um, the inheritance of the adopted sons is the possession of ecclesiastical peace. One is adopted and becomes a child of God when forgiveness of sins takes place in the church. There's also an emphasis here on the unity of the church, that uh, because you're adopted, you are part of the church and connected to the church, and you have to be uh, in the church. And so the Spirit makes Christians one with the body of Christ, the church. Uh, and this also, there's also an identification that the Spirit aids in prayer. That's another theme uh, that, gets, uh, that is prominent in the medieval tradition. The most striking emphasis is, the, uh, is their emphasis on a legitimate form of fear. Um, so the Glossa Ordinaria explains that the spirit of adoption and the spirit of, of fear, quote, is the same spirit but named differently because of different works. It's one spirit who causes two kinds of fears and who makes two kinds of slaves. All right, so if you're familiar with this uh, verse, if you're familiar with this passage in Romans 8, um, there's this language of slavery and fear. And so the Gloss Ordinaria explains that there is the slave who is also a son, who fears his master and honors his father, and then the other slave that fears punishment but does not love justice. And so that's what the Gloss Ordinaria is saying this doctrine of adoption is about. The adopted son still fears and does what is right. The familial or relational aspect of adoption is almost absent, and there's no connection to comfort or assurance that comes from uh, the medieval interpretation of Romans 8. So when we look at Occlumpatius and Calvin, we're going to see there's some substantial differences that get uh, made there with, these, with this tradition. Um, we'll also see there's substantial similarities between these two. So in the introduction to Calvin's uh, work on Romans, uh, T.H.L. Parker observes that Calvin includes chapter 8 here, uh, in his section on sanctification and the Christian life. Uh, he summarizes Calvin's comments as, quote, full of compensating compilations, consolations, uh, so that these comforts, these assurances, which Calvin treats eschatologically. Calvin identifies adoption in terms of her inheritance and the privileges of being an heir. He insists that the blessings in Romans 8 are only for the regenerate, and that they provide a certainty of assurance for the believer because of the inward witness of the Holy Spirit. The spirit of adoption for Calvin also enables a person to have an increasing trust and freedom in prayer. And that, again, is something that pushes against uh, the previous tradition. Other scholars, such as Brian Garrish, also note that in these passages on adoption, we see a theme of union with Christ. It's highlighted in Calvin's exposition. Those adopted as sons of God are united to Christ or participate with Christ and now have access to the Father's goodness. We should also include in this summary of Calvin's comments that despite the opportunity he has based on the wording there at the end of Romans 8 where it talks about predestination, Calvin doesn't develop his doctrine of predestination there. He doesn't comment on it at all. Rather, uh, he points to what one is predestined to and in this context, that it's predestined to becoming like Christ or bearing the cross like Christ. The most noticeable differences between Calvin's commentary and Occolampadius' commentary is that Calvin's is much more extensive than Occolampadius. He addresses more literary questions, philological questions, and offers other interpretations. A unique feature that we'll focus on here in Occolampadius' commentary is that he organizes it around eight major benefits of consolations. Uh, though he doesn't state the number or count it along the way, uh, he gives this introduction, hence Paul spe specifies an order of many consolation and benefits from which those who are sons of God receive consolation. And in this exposition along the way, Occlumpadius identifies each one starting with the phrase like, 
another constellation is. Calvin doesn't provide that kind of organizational structure, um, but many of the comments along the way are very similar. Um, like Calvin, Oculampanius also identified that Romans 8 was in a part of the book where Paul, quote, adds how faith is to be adorned with works, and where he addresses, where Paul addresses, quote, sanctification, freedom, life, and security from the Spirit of God. Interestingly, Oculampanius actually first brings up adoption in his comments on chapter 2, where it's talking about circumcision of the heart. The word adoption, sonship, none of that's even there, but what Oculampanius does is equates circumcision of the heart with adoption, with the doctrine of adoption, uh, rather than focusing on justification, which a lot of the other Protestant writers would do. Uh, so when Oculampanius gets to his comments on Romans 8, verse 14, he more specifically says that those adopted are called sons of God because they are regenerated by the Spirit of Christ. Very similar to what Calvin has done. Uh, he just, or Calvin will do later. Uh, he describes them as drawn by the Spirit with, quote, an in, a certain internal attractiveness. Um, likewise, we see Oculampadius explicitly diverge from the medieval exegetical tradition by emphasizing that adoption reveals the Father's love. In his comments on 8.19, he declares, The name Father is love, by which we call God on account of his great faithfulness. We no longer call him Lord as if we were honoring him in servile fear and not daring to approach him. Further, when we call him God the Father, we testify that he owes nothing to us, but we live solely by his generosity. So Aklampadis is specifying that the sons of God receive the spirit of adoption to set them free from the works of the law, free from this need to gain merit, and now with joyful mind they call upon God as Father, just like Christ, since he is the Son of God by nature, Aklampadis says, and we are sons of God by adoption. This contrasts greatly with the explanations of the spirit of adoption from the medieval exegetical tradition. Um, Aklampadius also makes the connection um, between the covenant and uh, adoption, and uh, Calvin develops that even further in this section. The major difference uh, that both of them emphasize with the covenant is that now that the Spirit has arrived, there's greater hope and confidence because the Spirit has been abundantly poured out. So we also find in Aklampadius a simple version of union with Christ. Uh, in Romans 8:17. Uh, he states that uh, we are heirs by adoption. On account of the same Spirit, whatever things are in Christ, the same are also ours. Therefore, the righteousness, holiness, innocence, inheritance, and whatever else that belongs to Christ are ours. And Calvin likewise will state that adoption is, quote, a manifestation that takes away all uncertainty in which we participate with the only begotten Son of God himself. So just as Parker had labeled and identified what Calvin has done uh, as eschatological, addressing this already, not yet, that we are both adopted now and that there's future ramifications of adoption. Oculampadius uh, makes those kinds of statements as well. And Calvin says that this verse uh, is found here for the purpose of anticipating an objection that the sons of God shouldn't have to go through afflictions to enter into glory. And then he rejects, in characteristic fashion, the frivolous distinction that scholastics make. The objection that he's referring to is one that Ocalampadius already raised in his commentary. So both Calvin and Ocalampadius identify this comparison between the present suffering and the future glory as these eschatological components. And then uh, I want to spend our last few minutes here talking about Ocalampadius' organization. So he has eight consolations. The first one is the brevity of this life. So he identifies, first of all, he consoles us by the brevity of this life. For the eternal is not to be compared with the momentary, nor the most pure joy with sporadic sadness. But the most trifling suffering which is inflicted on us by creation is not able to be compared with the highest joy that is received by the Creator. This is the very interpretation that Calvin also affirms as he rejects two others. And he states that this is an encouragement, the word cohortation, which is a synonym for consolation, uh, that any afflictions we experience here should not be grievous when compared with what we have in store for us. The second consolation that Akalampadius identifies is from verses 19 and 20, where he explains that all of creation, 
though spoiled and damaged by the effects of sin, still carries out its purpose of serving humanity so that all humanity can serve God, and that we as adopted sons of God look forward to all of creation being freed from corruption. This interpretation also diverges significantly from the medieval view that interpreted this not as translated it not as creation but as creatures and then interpreted the creatures as non-believers. And so that uh, Calvin rejects that interpretation as well as others and makes this statement. I understand the passage to have this meaning, that there's no element in no part of the world which being touched as it were with a sense of its present misery does not intentionally, intensely hope for a resurrection. So both Occlumpadius and Calvin find, it, uh, find the same interpretation and uh, explanation of what is going on here in verses 19 and 20, that all creation is going to be freed from corruption. And then related to that is his third consolation. Uh, Occlumpadius specified that when he writes another consolation, if creation is to be liberated and glorified, which serves us, how much more is the future glory of humanity, which is Lord of the world and sons of God, adopted? Uh, Calvin similarly reasons that if the Spirit of God will renew the, quote, hidden instinct in the lifeless parts of creation, how much more should one be assured that the down payment of the Spirit of God in adoption gives hope for a better condition for humanity and all creation? Both of these interpreters uh, identify that all of creation will be transformed and renewed and glorified in a parallel way that the sons of God, those who are adopted, will receive incorruptible bodies. This is certainly an eschatological reading of adoption, and it diverges from the previous tradition. Fourth consolation, the groaning from the Spirit. Uh, Akhilampani says, our groaning is not in vain because it comes from the Spirit. Here again, we find him reinforcing this eschatological nature of adoption. Uh, the groans have the desire for the bodily redemption. And he makes a distinction between the faithful who groan and the unfaithful who groan, who are impious in their groans because they just want to escape this suffering. Whereas he's acknowledging, and then Calvin will pick this up later, uh, that the pious groan with an anticipation of eternal and future glory. Um, so Calvin identifies the groaning of creation as a suitable comparison to the groaning of believers, showing how both by the Spirit groan and patiently wait for the deliverance that's expected. The fifth consolation Occlumpadius identifies is from the kindness we once received, or even which our ancestors received when they were often freed from severe dangers. He specifically makes the connection that the same Spirit who gave hope to those in the past, now more generously give hope to we in whom the Spirit dwells. Calvin also has longer, more extensive discussion, but notably here uh, provides this exposition, which is not entirely different from the exegetical tradition, um, but is an emphasis that both make. Akhilampati specifies the next, if you're keeping score, sixth consolation, uh, found in the help in our groans and prayers from the Holy Spirit. Um, the Spirit moves us so that we want what Christ wants rather than praying ignorantly for the wrong things. He also reasons that since the Spirit himself intercedes for us, it makes our prayers heard because, quote, it's impossible for the Spirit to be ungrateful to the Father and his Son. The Spirit's always going to pray the right thing because he knows what to pray. Um, he uses this, and Calvin will pick this up as well, to reject the medieval Catholic understanding of the intercession of the saints. We don't need the saints, just pray for us, because we have the Spirit praying for us. Um, and both Occlumpadius and Calvin identify that the result of having the spirit of adoption uh, is increased confidence in prayer, especially that we can pray our Father with confidence and with boldness. The seventh consolation of adoption for Occlumpadius is the worth of being the elect of God. So he connects Romans 8, 28 back to verse 14 of those who are led by the Spirit. And the consolation or the comfort that comes from the truth that God permits all things to happen for the benefit of his elect, for those he loves and are called according to his purpose, both in the past and for the future. That the Spirit groans for them and that even if they fall into sin, Occlumpadius makes a statement, God will humble them for their own good, like he did with people like David or Peter. Uh, 
Um, this, according to Akhilin Padi, should inspire one to hope even in the face of struggles because it reveals this kind will of God and our dependence on His grace. Last one, eighth. Akalampadius identified that the eighth and final consolation comes from God's foreknowledge and predestination of those, quote, who are Christ's adopted brothers. He particularly argued that, quote, to be conformed to his image is to be crucified with Christ. Both Akalampadius and Calvin point out multiple times that adoption is for the purpose of being conformed to the image of Christ, which they both identify means bearing one's cross like Christ. Earlier in his comments on verse 19, Akalampadius stated, quote, The unique way to salvation is through the cross, without which one does not enter into the glory of God. And in this, the Spirit of Christ is especially shown. And if we too wish to be conformed to his image, that means we follow him by bearing the cross. On that same verse, Calvin again notes various interpretations, but states, quote, I approve of the following in preference to any other. We are co-heirs with Christ, Provided in entering on our inheritance, we follow in the same way in which he has gone before. Christ came to it by the cross, then we must come to it in the same manner. Again, Calvin includes much more exposition and addresses other objections, but is reaching the same conclusion that Acolampadius had reached previously. So while both Calvin and Acolampadius are compelled to make distinctions about foreknowledge and predestination, to defend against the, the claim or the, the charge that God's the author of evil, they each have a slightly different focus, but also both come to the conclusion uh, that God is so determined that all whom he has adopted should bear the image of Christ. Calvin declares that it's our gracious adoption in which our salvation consists. It's inseparable from the other decree, which determines that we bear the cross. For no one can be an heir of heaven without being conformed to the image of the only begotten Son of God. Aklampadius concludes it this way, quote, It surpasses all consolation, so the eighth is the greatest. It surpasses all consolation to know that God wants the best for us, and that while the other consolations and promises ought to suffice, God, so that he might seal his promises, surrendered his only begotten, so that all things we receive are to be enjoyed as sons of adoption. So all of this to say, to show that this comparative analysis of Calvin and Acolampadius on Romans further validates that the adoption, the doctrine of adoption is a characteristically reformed doctrine and certainly a reformational doctrine. However, uh, we have to give up the notion that Calvin somehow uniquely originated uh, the interpretations of the biblical text that resulted in his theological conclusions. Calvin still popularized it. Calvin still made it more prominent and made a reform view of adoption grow, and he was very instrumental in shaping how it is still taught today. Um, but once other biblical commentaries, like those of Acolampadius, are consulted, we see that there are striking similarities. In fact, nearly all of the features that scholars have identified as Calvin's are uh, previously found in Aklampadis' commentary published 15 years earlier. Thank you for your attention.